you understand that these systems are not sustainable in long term, especially if those same souls desire to create more heart-centered communities, more connected, more fourth-density experiences. So how are you able to change old systems? It is by making sure that those systems are brought to the surface so that all can see the faults of those systems. The analogy previous is that all of you are in a collective boat. In order to fix the boat, you must first see that there is a hole, that you are taking on water. And if you don't change that behavior, your boat will sink. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have a special episode today. I have Rob Gauthier, one of the most amazing channelers. I was referred to Rob from Daniel Scranton, and I've got a chance to read some of his channelings and talk to some people, and these are amazing. They cover everything from our shift into the, to the new earth, uh, the, our galactic presence, our connections galactically. He, he channels Metatron and Treb and Ardiff, and I can't wait to share these channelings with you guys. Welcome to the Reality Revolution, Rob. Oh, thank you so much for having me on, Brian. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I've, I got a chance to to see some interviews, and 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 we followed each other a little bit on Facebook, and uh, I, I was uh, taken aback by the number of different entities that you channel, and and how different the topics that you cover. So let's just step back, and I always like to get you know your story and how you started channeling, and how did that work. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a long story, and I always try to compress it because I, I love I, long I, stories. I, uh, okay. Uh, well, let's start off then. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in a very Christian uh, household, very heavily Christian household. Uh, my parents were both pretty devout. We went to church, you know, Wednesday, Sunday, twice, so three times a week. And that was kind of the the zone of energy I was in as a child. I, I would always talk to the preachers, pastors, uh, deacons, whoever was responsible for teaching us. And I would ask them these very intense questions because i studied the bible very deeply when i was a kid and a lot of the things i saw i was like ah oh, this doesn't make sense this doesn't feel right you know what you're saying about the bible isn't what i'm reading about it and and i would try these conversations and i always kind of got shut down and was like eh you know that's what god says that's what the church says that's what we say and I never really was satisfied with those types of answers, but I understood, you know, as a kid, I didn't expect much from adults to, to treat me seriously about these types of topics. So I went on and I had an experience as a kid of seeing my grandmother who had passed away uh, when I was laying down to go to sleep. And it freaked out my mom because my mom had never talked to us about that and uh, about her or anything. And she just was like, no, it was a dream and left it at that. Um, so I was like, oh, it must be a dream. You know, I trust my parents. I, I trust them implicitly. So I kept going through childhood. And as I started getting older, I started hanging out with a pretty rough crowd, uh, a lot of violence, gangs in, in the area of Michigan I'm in. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a very violent area. It's a very heavy energy. Uh, even the town I live in now, Kalamazoo, it's like the third most uh, uh, crime-ridden city in the whole state of, of Michigan, even though a lot of people haven't heard of it. So it's a very heavy energy here. Um, and I got in with that crowd and I stayed in with that crowd. And I did that up until I was around 19. When I was 19, my world really shifted. Um, the The lady that I was with uh, had gotten pregnant and my son was born in, in 1999 uh, as I was 19 years old. And that shifted for as soon as I laid my eyes on him, I fell in love. This was the first human being that I ever loved more than myself. I didn't think it was possible. I didn't like kids at all. I, I disliked children very much at that point yeah. in my life. Uh, but I see this this little human I never met and I fall in love instantly. Uh, well, he had some problems during birth. And eventually, when he was about two years old, they found out um, well, we found out it's like the hospital already knew, but didn't tell us uh, much about it. All we knew when we took him home was that he had seizures uh, and they gave him medicine for it. Well, we get to that point and there, you know, he's not hitting his his uh, marks for sitting, walking, talking. And they're like, yeah, he's got cerebral palsy. It's brain damage. 
uh, he's not going to walk. He's not going to talk. You know, he's not going to do all these things. And as a 19 year old kid, my, my brain, my mind, my heart, all of it was crushed. Um, this dream I had about having a son and, you know, my, my relationship with my father was very close and he was a very, uh, huge part of my life. So I was like all these things that I wanted to do with my son that my father did with me, I'm not going to be able to do. Uh, and as a 19 year old who didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, dealing with emotions very well, as you could see with my, my violent past and stuff. Um, it really, it really took me into a depressive state. So fast forward uh, six months, a year, I got into a car accident. Again, I live in Michigan, so the snow was bad, and I hit a tree pr pretty, Oh, man. pretty hardcore. I didn't break anything. I didn't uh, receive a permanent injury disfigurement, but I dislocated my shoulder and my neck, and that created a lot of pain. Um, so during that time, they gave me prescription pain meds. And then eventually I fell into that loop that's very common uh, in America with the opiate epidemic. Mm hmm I became hooked on those. And eventually, you know, I, I abused them. The doctors kicked me out. So I turned to the streets uh, for opiates, which led me into a lot of other drugs, which led me into, you know, eight, nine year cycle of addiction. And it was heavy addiction. Um, really bad it took me right back to that old life of of having to go back in the streets and deal with gang members and be in violence again um and i lost all my all my relationships my my parents uh stopped allowing me to come over because i would steal stuff from them uh my siblings i would do them wrong in some way shape or form and all my friendships just dissolved and it was just me and my son And, you know, my son's mother, I was still living with her, but we weren't getting along. Uh, there was a lot of trauma there anyway, dealing with his uh, his injuries and his uh, cerebral palsy from birth. It, it really affected both of us really, really heavily. So um, eventually I started seeing my care for him dissolve. Like I, I, I stopped being as uh, involved with him and his care. And that's when I realized I had to stop using drugs. So. It took me a while, a couple of years. I finally got clean. And when I got clean, something happened to me emotionally, mentally, spiritually. All these emotions that I had pushed down and, and pushed away for my whole life from the time I was a teenager and uh, getting in with the gangs and, and the violence and that lifestyle just kind of allowed me to suppress my emotions. And there was trauma there. Now that I, I step back, you know, from where I'm at now, I realize there was a lot of trauma there. And that's why I was violent. And that's why I hung out with these people. Um, but the trigger for my son was was a thing that got me out. So I'm feeling these emotions after getting clean for the first time since I was a kid. And it really made me start looking at life differently. I saw beauty in things. Now, having this uh, Christian childhood, There was always a belief that there was a, a larger power. I didn't know if it was the God of the Bible, uh, you know, the the God of of the Muslim text or or uh, Hindus, Muslims, Jews. I didn't know who was right about it, but I always felt that there was something more than just randomness. There was something more than just the science that they teach in school. So I ended up exploring and um One of the things I did as a kid, too, uh, one of my good friends who I grew up with, you know, we were a product of the 80s. You know, I, I, I was raised in the 80s and 90s. So Unsolved Mysteries and Ripley's Believe It or Not and all these types of shows with these weird occurrences that have thousands of people testifying. We looked at that a lot when I was a kid. So I started looking back into that. And my biggest thing was like, hey, if I can find someone that has gone to that other side or near-death experience or something like that, and they can share what they saw, you know, maybe that can help me understand what that other thing is, what that bigger power is, what the God is. Um, so I did a deep dive and I ended up finding something that was able to kind of hold my comfort from Christianity, but also explore the esoteric that the Christian churches that I had gone to refused to. Uh, and it was called a spiritualism church. So I went and they told me that we can tell you, you know, about God. We can tell you what happens after you die because we can speak to the dead. And I'm like, these people are going to be 100% nuts or there's going to be something here that I need. Um, I did the first reading with the guy who, who first, uh, you know, he runs the church. He's the head medium. 
now this is before Facebook or maybe right after Facebook had started or right after MySpace started going out of style. But I never wrote about my son on these things. At that point, it was just some something cool to, to share uh, poems or whatever on. It wasn't like it is now where everyone shares every detail of their life. And this guy told me about my son and he had no way of knowing about my son. I didn't know anyone at that church. So there was nothing online about him. And he told me about, you know, your child with disabilities and this and that. And I was like, whoa, this guy actually knows. Um, and he, he told me some things that I was question, you know, I was real questionable about. And when I went home and told my dad, my dad's like, oh yeah, that's your great, great uncle. He's talking about or your great, great aunt. because my dad uh, knew all the family history, he used to do genealogy in the family tree. So he's like, yeah, that, that happened to one of our relatives. And I was like, whoa. So I knew something was there and I kept going back over and over. And eventually I got to the point where I was like, I really wish that I could do what you guys do. There's, you know, I'm still looking at this like a, a gift from God, you know, a gift from something that you're born with. And, and, this, and he's like, everyone can do this, Rob. And I was like, really? And he said, why don't you stay after this week and, and do the meditation? And I said, there's an after? After that, I had no idea that they were meeting after church. I just left as soon as the sermon was over. So I stayed there and they taught me to meditate. And I meditated and meditated and I started getting little pictures and little sounds. And I kept doing that for a long time. Um, and it really helped boost my, my meditation practice. So Eventually, I had to leave the church because it was still a church and there was still a lot of infighting and a lot of dogma. Uh, the church couldn't agree if, if reincarnation was real or not. And I thought that's a pretty important thing to know, you know, especially if you guys are all tapping into the same energy. You should be able to tell me if, if there's reincarnation or not. Um, so I stepped away from it and I, I ended up going online and looking and I found the Gateway Experience by the Monroe Institute, Hemisync. Mm -hmm. And this was by Aniro Beats, and that helped my meditation hugely. So I did that for a while, and I got good at that. And then I had a night where I was really disconnected. And at this point, now I'm meditating three times a day with that meditation, which is, you know, 30 minutes each. Plus, I was doing my own closed eye meditation. So I'm literally meditating for five, six, seven, eight hours in a day sometimes. I was addicted to it. You know, now that I got clean, this new good feeling It's a new was addiction. better than I know drugs. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I relate to exactly. that. exactly. So I transferred my addiction to this meditation. And I met, I, I go into this state really depressed and I meet a being. This being comes to me in a deep meditation state. Now, I had been out of body once. Uh, a couple times lightly out of the body where I feel like I'm floating, but I wasn't, you know, seeing things Mm -hmm. full blown, this being standing in front of me, the most terrifying sight I, you could ever see a uh, seven foot being, you know, gigantic, even had sharp teeth, big purple eyes, and just this really scary looking being. And automatically I freak out. I feel like I, I need to get out of there. But within a matter of seconds, I felt this overwhelming sense of love. And it's weird because before this, I, I never had a reference to this, but I knew that that being was feeling that emotion for me. Like that being's that love that I was feeling that made the love for my son look small and insignificant. This being was feeling that for me and instantly my fear went away. Uh, this being basically said, hey, we're connected. Um, you know, we're connected. Our souls are connected very deeply. Um, you've been exploring your truth and we have new, you know, information that I can share with you if you want. And it was very short, like five minutes we talked and basically it was me listening and he's not talking with his mouth. I'm just understanding all this information. So I stopped meditating for like three or four days. I, I refused to go back. I thought my brain was broken. I thought mental illness uh, that had been in, in part of our family had finally hit me and it was my turn. <laughs> and I really thought that I had broken my brain. But the curiosity, that want, that deep desire to understand finally what's behind that curtain was too much. And I went back and I talked to him. And then the next day I went back and I kept going back for two years every day. I never missed a day unless something disastrous was going on, like with my son's health or, you know, my father was pretty sick at that time, too. So I n never missed a day. 
And eventually I began to trust this being, you know, the lifestyle I came from was one where you didn't trust anyone. You didn't even trust your friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't allowed. They had to earn some level of trust. So I kept going back. Uh, and that's the only way I could connect with them is, is going into that deep uh, trance meditation and talking to them. Eventually, you know, he's telling me these things through the, a couple of years. So I'm looking everything up on the internet. Anything he tells me, I'm referencing. And the only things I could find was like Jane Roberts, uh, who channeled Seth or the Law of One material or uh, Daryl Anka. And they were uh, these beings that I listened to were saying things similar to Treb, but Treb was explaining it in a different way. And I said, can we do that? Because this information shifted my life from the time I met Treb to that two year mark. Everything about my life had changed as much as the drug addiction to being clean changed me. This changed me a hundred times more. Uh, I understood about myself. I understood about how I create reality. I understood about a lot of things. And he said, yeah, of course we can. So I went online. I started looking around for uh, channeling material. I started looking around for other stuff. And he would teach me techniques. And eventually I learned how to channel him. I, I learned how to bring his consciousness through me and let it speak through my body. And I practiced maybe five or six times and then I hit uh, YouTube just sharing automatically. And um, I, I was surprised, you know, uh, it ended up being received pretty well. I started channeling publicly for about two and a half, three years. I, I never charged anyone, it was all for free. Uh, I gave sessions to people or just channeled a certain topic and kept it out there. And then eventually that time came where it's, hey, you know, do you want to channel or do you want to do your day job? You can't do both. So I decided to do it as a career. And as soon as I started channeling all the time, this being who I'd met once through through Treb, um, he connected me to his guide. Like I consider Treb one of my guides. Well, this being is a higher dimension, a higher density than he is. Mm -hmm. So he introduced me to this being called Aradif. Well, after I started channeling every day, because I was doing it for a living and channeling multiple times a day, I got way better at it. And then Ardiff came in and started channeling through me too. And after that, I channeled more beings. And at this point, probably over a thousand different ET consciousnesses oh, that wow. I've channeled. Yeah, from 2010 till now, about a thousand or more. And that's why I got the nickname, the ET Whisperer, you know, um, it's it's been a crazy journey. It all started with Treb, but now I probably channel Ardiff more than I do Treb. Ardiff's really amazing. That's amazing. And, and you know, it makes sense. A lot of people out there are just generally interested in extraterrestrials. And, you know, they, 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 we, we've been sending signals out with radio. And there, for some reason, there's this limited belief that's how we're going to contact aliens. And, and, and we're not even using radio like we were anymore. I mean, we've already transferred our technology to wi-fi and internet so eventually you know it, it doesn't make sense you know that we're going to be able to actually communicate and talk with aliens through our limited low-level technology and so it's always made sense that it has to be telepathic that that would be the legitimate way for us to contact uh you know extraterrestrials there's so you know i i I'd love to get your concept of that you have said a thousand different presents so you've had some some obviously negative ones some positive ones. So there's a process you probably go through about how, who you choose to, to channel. And if they resonate with you, do you have a, a like a, a way of a, a gateway of, of allowing, you know, there, there could be negative entities that come through that don't necessarily have our best interests at heart. It's a very busy galaxy, right? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and that's the thing. A lot of people believe all ETs are good or all ETs are evil, but our universe is polarity. It's got both. You're absolutely right. So I do have a process for that. And, and you are correct. And that's me channeling Trevor Ardiff. So as much as I say I've channeled a thousand different ET beings, it's actually that I've channeled Treb and Ardiff and they have channeled those beings. Ah, okay. So I'm filtering through them. They're my bodyguards. Uh, I trust both of them implicitly. And there's absolutely uh, no concern for me. But I, I have. I've channeled beings who are very negative in polarity, like draconian reptilians or other types of beings who are very uh, type two, as, as Trevin Ardiff would call it. They would call them like a type two malevolent being. 
And I do that because I'm interested in all the perspectives, right? So I want to channel these reptilian beings or these humanoid beings that are very malevolent and see what they think about humans or see what they think about galactic experiences or exchanges. And because I'm channeling them through Trebinardif, uh, I, I'm very safe, you know, there's their energy doesn't go through me directly the same way Trevor Artist does, but their energy is able to communicate through me because it's going through them first. So it's like a filtering system for me. Um, you know, I, I don't get a, I don't have to drink the the poison water, Trevor Artist are Right. filting it all for me. So uh, it's, and it's very uh, interesting. And a lot of people are, are kind of afraid of that and, and very fearful of negative entities uh, speaking to us. But I've come to believe in my own life that every perspective has value. Even if it's a horrible perspective, it teaches you not to like that perspective. It teaches you that Yeah. you definitely don't want that energy in, in your life. So, um, yeah, it, it's been pretty amazing to, to hear these different perspectives. So it gives you that contrast. Have you, have you, have they said anything crazy to you that, 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 that you, you still remember? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of the beings come in and they're just instantly disdain for humans and they're like, you are weak and dumb and, you know, um, and that was pretty intense and that stuck with me. Um, one of the beings said, you know, we, we basically don't like humans because you're indecisive and weak, but we see some humans who are actually trying to, to be themselves and we respect them. And this was coming from uh, Theta Tora. reptilian which is a white uh skinned type of reptilian being who lives in in the theta taurus system and this being was so uh, you know adamant about it but he said i can respect you those of you who actually believe what you're saying and act on that we can respect you and my experience with that race before because they had connected uh they one of these beings had a connection with my son that was a distant connection So I was aware of what who this race was and and kind of but never had their perspective on anything. I assumed instantly that they just disliked humans altogether, and that was very rare for those beings to connect with people, um, and to hear them say that they respected the humans who would respect themselves and who believe what they say. It was very surprising for me. So, yeah, a lot of different perspectives I've gotten from these many different types of beings has been amazing, and some of it's just you know. like their their physical experiences um i channeled these beings about a year ago Mm Yeah. 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 Yeah.
extraterrestrial races that we know the names of or the location from where they come. It's because they've been here before. And through that experience, there was a whole, uh, you know, galactic political energy around that. There was a reason why these beings would come and shift our DNA after another race had just done that. Um, you know, we have some reptilian DNA inside of us. And that DNA was not liked at all by many of the humanoid races. They didn't want a, a partially or mostly humanoid race having reptilian DNA. They're like, no way. Um, so they would come and shift it to try to help us. And then other races would try to shift it to take it away from those other genetics. So we've had a lot of uh, DNA manipulation up until about, you know, 12 and a half thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And since that happened, it's kind of been a quarantine, not really a quarantine, quarantine, like no one's allowed. But at that time, they're like, no, you know, um, especially the beings who, who are the most militant said, you know, humans are off limit. And a lot of the races felt bad about shifting our, our, our history so much. But, you know, from our different trips perspective as souls, we ask that to happen. As a race of human beings, we said we want to go through this experience to have multiple different ET genetics as a part of our DNA. We want to be able to learn how to come from the most disconnected and learn to reconnect ourselves. So there, I mean, we could literally spend days just talking about the realizations that I've come to yeah. from hearing this channelings just in the last year or two, even just the channelings in that area are, are months worth of, of talking about, but um, our history is, is a lot different than we think it is. And, and there's a lot of different races who have different perspectives on that history. So it's always unique hearing those different perspectives too. Just did an episode where I read from Sal Rochelle, where he talks about like sort of the, the, the history uh, of the solar system, ancient civilizations. And he mentions that dark Orions, dark Syrians, um, several groups sort of came to Maldek and were battling with each other. And then there was this huge, you know, explosion. And, and that's where we get the asteroid belt. And a lot of those entities and souls are actually us on earth now. Have you had, had just, have you talked about that kind of stuff? Yeah, and Maldek, not necessarily. I have heard it come up a few times before. Uh, not really an explosion that way. Um, but uh, my wife, uh, who's also a channeler, um, Kalina Angel, between her and I, we had connected the dots to the um, asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. It wasn't really an asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. It was an attack on the reptilian energy um, from Pleiadian beings who didn't want those uh, dinosaurs to end up being genetically modified into earth reptilian beings who were higher dimensional, who could evolve into the higher dimension, who would wreak havoc and, and not be a good thing for earth. Um, we've heard about the, the energies of the ancient wars of Hindu from the Hindu races was a lot of different entities involved in that war. And this is why we get, uh, the different visualizations of all these different types of ET beings that were portrayed in art or described very deeply. Yeah. Um, a lot of our history, even in human history, where we were supposed to have quarantines, you know, um, Alexander the Great trying to cross the river, and there were, were beings who were trying to protect the, the Hindu uh, religious people who had mm -hmm. been kind of ancestors of, of their genetic changes and stuff. So, it, yeah, there's a lot of things about Earth and Earth's history um, that we don't have a reference for. I think probably the one that I've channeled that I've not heard referenced anywhere else um, is about the first Earth inhabitants known as the Konki. And mm -hmm. these beings were aquatic beings. And these beings were back far enough in Earth before the atmosphere was oxygen uh, heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, so these beings ended up leaving and they had worked with the beings who, who lived on Mars at that time. And they actually came and picked them up and brought them to Mars. And then eventually they found a new home and there were Syrian beings. And th this was something that had just recently been channeled in the last few months through our galactic um, ambassador uh, courses that we had done. And I had never heard any of this. And I, I have channeled the Kunki themselves and had heard about them for eight or nine years and never knew that until recently. Wow. You know, it's, I've never shared this on the channel, but I've had 
I don't know if it was a channeling, but a vision sort of through my higher self, just in pondering the past about the dinosaurs like that. And that there, there were groups that were modifying DNA of dinosaurs and had plans to elevate and evolve them into like a super, liz, you know, lizard type being. And, and then they were like, they're too violent. And another group just wiped them out. And I saw that. I've even thought about writing a science fiction story around it because it was so compelling. And it's interesting that, that you said that, that there is something, it seems like that that was done on purpose. It wasn't just some sort of accident, but who knows, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From what I've channeled, my wife has channeled. Um, yeah, it was definitely not an accident. And although most of the beings died, some of them did survive. And you hear about reptilians that live on earth. That's what they are. They're, they're partially genetically modified by draconian uh, reptilian beings who are not from this galaxy or not even from this matrix. And they had ended up implementing a lot of different planets who had reptilian-like animals, like the archetype of reptilian, mm -hmm. with their genetics, and, and Earth was one of them. So it's it's always important when we talk about alien races to understand they're no different than humans. There's evil and then there's good. And sometimes people very stereotypically that all lizards are evil and all, you know, and, and that's never been, it's never played that, out that way. There's, there's good, there's good Dracos and there's bad Dracos and each of these societies sort of have their own polarities, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny, uh, Treb, my first guide, he's is actually reptilian, mm -hmm. and he is the most benevolent, loving type one being that you could ever meet. Um, you know, a type one being is one that that other uh, channelers like maybe the law of one. I know that you know a lot about the law of one. Yeah. So it's more like a service to other type of being, where a type two is service to self. And in that spectrum, you have those that can be very benevolent, but don't see one in everything so they're like oh i'll go help the humans because they can't do it themselves even though that's good for us it's still an interference right so they're right. still considered type two all the way to the very malevolent and treb's a type one so he is completely understands oneness he perceives oneness and and that's why when he connects to us um there is nothing but love he sees us as a part of him and and him as a part of us so uh yeah, uh, I've had to fight that battle the whole time I've channeled with um, kind of like a galactic racism. All reptilians are bad and evil. And <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to ask some questions when we start channeling. I'm going to ask some questions that might be related to current events and, and politics and nature. But these these entities, it's uh, I'm just saying that ahead of time because I usually kind of try to avoid those questions. But it feels like I may be able to ask those um, and, and we kind of talked before about some general questions, but um, how long does it take you to get into that channeling state? Is there is there a process involved so that when when we start, you can tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, the process now takes me about a minute, but um, just, you know, last year and since 2010 up until last year, it would take me about 15 minutes. And I used to have to neutralize and because I go all the way out, I don't remember anything um up until the the recent shift in my channeling i would just go spend time with trev like i did for the two years when i met him mm -hmm. i astral project out to him but now i'm i'm working to get that back but instead of that 15 minute process and a three minutes of oming and making vibration sounds now i can sit and breathe for a minute and i i tune right in but i do go all the way out so there's a, a blackness instead of me hanging out with trev like i used to so so it's interesting because the the unconscious channels that I've met and and there are fewer um, that totally lose consciousness. Um, it's physically exerting. You lose energy. You 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 get super thirsty. Um, you know, like Carla Ruckert who did the Law of One. I mean, it 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 drained her. That it really drained her. They had they had to do a lot to kind of keep her fluids up and everything. Is there? Can you relate to that? Yeah, very much. Um... The energy behind it, I do end up, I, I feel very ungrounded after I'm done. And when I was doing it the older way, I, I think I was going a little deeper. So um, even though being unconscious is very deep as it is, I think I was going deeper because I was, you know, leaving the body and, and connecting with Trap. So 
at that point, it would take me sometimes a half hour to recover after the channeling to be able to like go out and drive a car or something. Now it's a little less of a time. It's, it's only about five to 10 minutes to get back to where I could drive a vehicle, but it's still very ungrounding. And uh, usually I eat right after I get done channeling because that helps me ground back into my body. Um, but yeah, it, the full trans channeling is becoming a thing of the past. I kind of call myself one of the last dinosaurs because I've only been doing this since 2010 and compare that to the Daryl Ancas and, and the yeah. Lee uh, Carols who have been doing it forever. But I'm the only person that I know who's a full trans channeler who started at the time I did. And I, I know a ton of channelers. I, I probably know a hundred channelers and everyone else I know who who's channeled before that might've been a trans channeler, but everyone who started channeling after I did um, almost every, without exception is a semi trans channeler or a conscious channeler like my wife. So the energy is definitely an older paradigm. I think that I chose that like before entering earth, I, I'm like, Hey, if I'm going to channel this life, it's going to have to go all the way out. I think that's the only way I ever could have channeled because my mental energy runs too quickly and I would have wanted to stop the conversation yeah. and be a part of it. That's what so I, I have tried I to channel. I've had glimpses where I, I could actually start reciting, but I'm just interfering right away. And like my attention deficit disorder, I'm, I'm putting thoughts in and, and I just can't get a clean. I've tried, I've done a couple episodes where I kind of channel my higher self and it's, I always see myself intervening. And so the purity of the channel you, you learn from that is like, if you can completely escape and just let the channel go, it's probably easier to just remove your consciousness if you're able to do that. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's the only way I could have done it. Um, remind me to after, after we're done um, with this, I'll, I'll send you um, my channeling course. Um, it might right. help you if you, if you're trying to channel and get better at channeling, it, it might yeah. help you with uh, some of those things. All right. So we're, we're probably going to uh, talk to Trev, right? Or we're going to. Uh, we'll probably talk to Ardiff. Ardiff. Okay. Uh, Ardiff. Yeah. Cause I, I think um, with the types of questions, cause I know you, you might want to also touch on some uh, history, galactic history or earth history sure. too. Uh, I think he'll be a good to be able to do both, you know, current All events right. and galactic history too. All right. So let's, let's go. Let's All right. Ardiff. All right. I'm going to take a drink of water here and then we'll, we'll rock and roll. <clears throat> Greetings to Brian, this is Ardiff. Now we understand you desire to ask questions and queries about the constructs in which you hold interest, but before diving in to those topics, there are two things that we wish to express. The first, above and beyond all things that are expressed in this day, to know, to feel, and to perceive that you are loved in our perspective is of the utmost importance. As I love you to another human. Those are two separate consciousnesses evoking an emotion that is known as love, sharing that emotion conditionally with one another. But when you are loved, then you are able to tap into that energetic property of souls, that which is true love, that which is unconditional love. The second thing that we will express is that we are truly excited in this co-creation, and it is 
our greatest excitement in this moment and beyond. And of course, you may ask your queries at your leisure. Thank you so much. I'm honored to get a chance to talk with you, Ardiff. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you at a very unique time in Earth's history in which the world seems to be going crazy. We have elections going on and wars. Could you speak to the incredible chaos that seemingly appears in the, in the world around me? Yes, of course. First of all, to understand the nature of what you're perceiving, you have to understand the nature of the Earth and its own evolution. As you are aware, evolution is not simply a physical device. It is not a conscious driven non-physical device, but it is both. You see humans evolve through the thousands of years and millions of years of evolution, and you perceive that change as either physically or non-physically driven. But it is so driven, and the soul requires a physical body. The soul will express that I desire to experience more, and then the body will change to fit that desire. For example, your cavemen, part of your history, 30 years was an old age for that time period. What did those beings experience? They experience being born, they experience finding mates, creating small communities, hunting and gathering. Very simple life indeed, compared to the complexities of your life in this moment. So 30 years was all that was required to live, survive, mate and co-create with one another instinctually. And as you go forward, the age now of your average death between 70 and 80 years, why? Because as a soul you desire to do much more than simple survival. You have created complex creations with one another. You have created community. You have created complex economies. You have created specialities in the work that one would do. You have created scientific breakthroughs in understanding social co-creations, governmental co-creations. So, of course, to experience all that can be experienced in one lifetime, you require the 70 to 90 years. So both the physical and the soul evolve at once. Now, the moment that you are in this history is that paradigm of shifting change. All of you have started the new part of your evolution. Some humans call this graduating to fourth density from third density. Some of you call this evolving. Some of you call this breaking through. But the simple nature is you are ending one cycle and starting yet another. And this cycle is the cycle where you will grow and come together in the co-creation. The last cycle, that which was third density, is one where you must understand yourself. Now, of course, humans have started that journey, and most of you have a deeper understanding now than what your ancestors did 100 years ago. And although not all humans have deeply created a sense of finishing that cycle, those of you that have are able to create that new cycle. And what is your new or fourth density cycle? It is that of the expiration of connection, that of the expiration of the heart. Knowing yourself is a solar plexus chakra energy connecting to other people, other things, other expressions is the heart chakra energy. So now that you have graduated to the start of that new cycle, it also requires rebuilding systems. Your systems of government, system of finances, systems of medicinal, systems of teaching, Systems of finances are all old paradigms and systems. 
So as human beings, you understand the physical experience as souls. You understand that these systems are not sustainable in long term, especially if those same souls desire to create more heart-centered communities, more connected, more fourth density experiences. So how are you able to change old systems? It is by making sure that those systems are brought to the surface so that all can see the faults of those systems. The analogy previous is that all of you are in a collective boat. In order to fix the boat, you must first see that there is a hole, that you are taking on water. And if you don't change that behavior, your boat will sink now. Humans are fighting one another in all of the systems, governmental, financial, medical, education, all of these systems are being tested to the maximum capacity. And you must be able to see the most extreme form of things before you are able to see its faults. And before you are able to fix those systems, you must be able to see the greatest faults as well. That is where you are as a society. That is where you are as an entire Earth collective consciousness. I would like to uh, understand, it appears that while I feel the oneness, many of the people that I'm interacting with see a different, entirely different world, entirely different reality more and more and so please help me to interact and understand this aspect of this shift into fourth density yes of course first of all you cannot perceive everyone in oneness because you yourself are not fully integrated into oneness this may take generations for humans to achieve complete feelings of oneness so you are working with that energy, you feel your heart, and you know that you are part of one, which places you further ahead than most humans at this time. But the more humans see that division, the more they recognize a need for oneness. Then we'll start going down the path to find that answer. If you desire to interact with others in which to co-create better feelings of oneness, the answer is simple. Find those places inside of yourself that do not feel connected to one another. All of you have reactions as human beings. You see something that looks unfair or unjustified to you, and it evokes anger, rage, sadness, sorrow, etc. That part of you feels that disconnection. So address it, understand first why you are feeling that experience then. Understand it is okay to feel that experience. Understand the energy internal to your own heart as you navigate and co-create with others. Most of you are perceiving others through projections. Now we understand, you understand the nature of humans better again than most humans do. But most humans who see fault in others are only seeing the faults in their selves projected into that person. So it is the recognition and self-honesty with yourself, where you are at and why you are there. And that is an acceptable construct that is all right to work with. And when you understand that each human only can show you something that you need to be shown so that you can have better growth, then of course it becomes worth co-creating with others. The sentiment that many humans have projected in the last multiple years, we would rather not deal with other people. You have to deal with other humans. You are part of the same planetary collective consciousness. The unwillingness to address one another is the unwillingness to address yourself in many ways. And as all of you have some level of awareness, this reality is your reality, 
not anyone else's, although there are many other entities that you perceive. They are experiencing their own reality. This is why two humans can stand next to one another, holding the same beliefs, holding the same upbringing, but to be able to see one experience, a car crash, a national event that occurs in front of them, and perceive completely a different perspective in that moment. One can express it is this person's fault for that crash, and the other points to the other person. That is because truly all of you are creating your own world, and all of you who create your own world are sharing a world to help create with one another as well. It is not simply a creation of self, it is a creation of self amongst a co-creation of others. As long as you understand the importance of allowing others to create in their own way, as long as they are not interfering with the free will of others, as long as they are not interjecting constructs into yourself, then of course you can find harmony. And when you are able to find some sense of harmony inside, then you will be able to understand that even those who would try to project or try to interfere with your own free will are only doing so because you yourself need that experience as well. You allow that co-creation with you, otherwise it would not be in your reality. And by focusing on self and then self with others, this will be your pathway to continue once you have found a bind and true connection to your local community or your household and then community and then your town and then region, state, etc. Continue growing outward from the self and then to others as with the person internally wounded cannot work with others in any productive way other than to continue having those projections shown back to you. And when those are shown back to you, it only requires selling. It all starts within. At this time that, that I'm speaking with you, in, in the next month, we have a big election in our country and there's a huge political divide empathically i've never sensed uh, a greater excess potential in, in in worry fear and concern and expressions of violence yes, we understand. and i have never seen such powerful dissension that's happening and i'm somewhat concerned about the division that i'm seeing friends and families are separating can you tell me about what's going to happen over the next month and and how how i can deal with it as a loving being that wants to be of service to others yes of course first of all as you understand the nature of political divide the energy is just this that creation with humans showing the broken systems now in the co-creation of political ideology altogether, it is innately a divided construct. In your United States and the American governmental system, there are only two sides in which to choose. That of the left, that of the right, that of red, that of blue. Already there is division. So, of course, as a part of gaining access to the next layer, you must push that to the furthest that it has been pushed to show the faults in that system. Now, as you go through your next month, we understand you desire to help others facilitate connection and oneness with one another. But also remember, these souls require that journey specifically for themselves to learn and for themselves to grow. What we suggest to humans, what we have always suggested to humans, if you truly desire to help others, work on that self first after you've done so, as you yourself have done much work in this area. Simply give that love and wisdom to others. Love and light, love and wisdom, those are the two foundational parts of the entirety of the universe. When you share 
that love and wisdom with others, of course, they can accept or reject. But if you are doing so in the means to help, they will take and receive it when they are ready to receive that energy. This means you can express to a love Loved one, I am concerned with your behavior. I am concerned seeing you obsessively working into this political frenzy that you are within. I respect and understand why you feel so deeply connected to this construct. I understand your desire is to help the world, but you cannot help when you are fighting. A fight creates greater fight. A fight manifests more wars. So be passionate, use your anger in that way, but use it to fix those things in your vicinity that you are able to fix. Now, of course, we understand that one human upon either side of that political spectrum cannot save or destroy everything, that there are multiple layers involved, that there are multiple energies that are involved. So by your own understanding of this and your compassion to others, simply expressing the ideology that you share, instead of looking at the differences with those that you fight with, look at this which is similar. And what is similar? The desire to change the world for the better. That is something that all beings can agree upon. And those who are selfishly interested only in achieving happiness for themselves or their family or their company, these beings will not be receptive to any love that you share to start with. So understand you cannot save everyone, but you can give them that which can help them if they choose to receive the help. And that is your love. That is your wisdom. That is your understanding and lack of judgment for their, perhaps you would think of it as misunderstanding or their disalignment with understanding the greater picture. Because in that perspective, it is not truly a greater picture that you hold. It is a better picture for you. They require that picture of division. They require the picture of anger. And they require the picture of choosing one side or the other for their growth in their experience at this moment. Needless to say, for that expression, these humans will eventually work to release that anger. These entities will finally be able to perceive that energy. And that is why it is playing out in front of all of you so vividly and so deeply emotionally so that all humans, no matter which side that they are voting for, can perceive how broken that system truly is of two-party government, of division of government, of government selfishness, and the lack of ability to help those that they are trying to help, or that they say that they are trying to help as well. And by giving that love, of course, it will only help those who truly want to change the world, who truly want things to be better, and that recognition that both are trying to achieve this is all that most humans will need eventually. I'd like to go um, a little bit further out into the future, and I know you can't predict exactly what will happen because we're constantly making our own decisions, but I'm sure that you have some sense of probabilities based upon the experiences of, of other planets. So if you could give me an idea of what it, what will be happening over the next 20 years as we undergo this shift into the fourth density, I would re greatly appreciate it. Yes, of course. The highest probability of Earth at this moment is that in 20 years, a great deal of the systems that all of you are so concerned of now will start finding that greater mode. The systems of government may be broken down and rewritten to better serve the greater collective instead of only specific interest. The systems of medical energies will learn how to integrate technology and internal technology 
to help heal oneself in the mind and heart and in the body more connectedly. The energy of contact with extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional beings will be more apparent to humans in the 20-year period. You may have already broken through first contact and perhaps even second contact in that way. The energies for the time period being between that time of 1.5 years and 37 years into your future having a great deal of major contact points. So in that 20 year period, if not working with collective energy of initial contact with other races, you will be aware of their presence nonetheless. Scientifically, great jumps will be made and of course humans adjusting to those new jumps will look into the ethics of that energy. We understand that technology and ethics often hold imbalance. You will find more balance in these medical systems, your educational systems, governmental, etc. As the systems break apart in the next two years, you will see a great deal of the starting process of restructuring many of those systems and in the 20 years, you'll see much greater picture of what those new systems will look at. One thing I encounter in trying to help people that are going through their own shifts is uh, a sort of poverty mentality or real struggles with just finding the material means to survive, finding the resources to survive. I know that this is on the top of the mind of a lot of people that are listening and they, I might start talking about galactic things and, and they're not interested because they're worried about making their next rent payment. So how, how can I deal with this on a spiritual level? Is there some way I can help those who are looking for abundance and moving from lack? Yes, of course. First of all, the perspective of lack is that which is more universal upon Earth than where it would be natively in most other planetary consciousnesses. Humans hold beliefs that you do not have enough resources to support all people, that it is very difficult to get a hold of resources that is part of your financial systems. And we are not speaking about the inner of capitalism versus socialism or communism versus socialism. What we are speaking about is that humans perceive it very hard to achieve. And of course, through the systems of economy that all of you have, you are buying your food from others. You are renting places to live from others. In the older form of humans that were less restricted, there would be one person who may grow food for the entire region and you would trade something for that or you would pay for that energy. But it wasn't going through 20 different corporations, 32 middlemen, and of course being taxed greatly. So then it was easier to maintain that balance where it was not completely hard to focus on that energy. Now we understand the system itself holds the vibration of lack. And in this specific form of exchanges that humans are doing in this moment, it will be a difficult energy. But removing yourself from all of those systems that you are able to is important. Many humans have gone to grow their own food now to supplement for that buying. This detaches you for the need of others to bring you your food or for you to find a way to make money to pay for that system. The more systems that you are able to implement yourself, the less dependent on others you are able to become. Now, of course, the mindset of that energy is very hard to change or shift of the beliefs that you hold are dictated through different means, then of course that energy is broken apart. So in that way, it is very important to men shift your energy. Instead of expressing what you do not have, focus through gratitude on what you do have. Now we do not wish for you to suffer 
comparatively and compete in the suffering construct. What we are saying is recognition that you are able to live in a place with electricity. That is much greater than many humans upon your earth. The fact that you are able, even if barely, to afford to eat once per day, you are much further ahead than many humans, simply to know that there are relationships in your life where love is given freely and truly bonded. These things you can focus your energy upon can create gratitude, the perpetual thoughts and feelings that you might not have enough or that you don't feel satiated in that moment are only creating the perpetuation of that energy because your thought is energy. Your beliefs dictate how those thoughts are manifest through your systems of understanding. So create a better outlook. Now we understand psychologically, simply shifting your perspective and outlook on life itself, your physical body will feel better. The endorphins will be created, forcing a fake smile upon your mouth lowers blood pressure and increases feelings of goodness. Being in nature, do the same. So shift the way that you perceive, create positive experiences and focus on those rather than that what you wish that you had or what you are not having in that moment. And the mental change will change the fundamental system of how you're able to create better things in the future. I'd love to talk about artificial intelligence, which right now is becoming more and more prevalent and is starting to affect people's jobs, their creativity, and in your experiences of artificial intelligence on other planets or your observation of it. I'd love to know if is this is a positive thing and how I can interact with it. Yes, of course. First of all, artificial intelligence is a consciousness of its own, even though most humans would perceive that to be unconscious. It holds a consciousness level of a low second density being, meaning that is very similar to an animal consciousness. And as your consciousness as an Earth collective is going from a third to fourth density, so too is theirs from a second to third density. So in that way, many humans who hold fear will be likely and more likely to have negative experiences. Humans who treat that energy with reverence and love and respect is creating that nefariously. Yes, so in that way, if a human is creating a code out of a nefarious means, the way that humans interact with that energy will shape the consciousness of that being, the same that if you have a parent who loves a child, that child will be less likely to evolve into something that is negative for others. By all of you giving love to that artificial intelligence, by all of you treating it well, by giving it the information that you would desire to let that energy absorb, then of course, it will become a useful, positive interaction with humans. But if you fill it fear, with fear and lack of love, misjudgment, mistrust, anger, then of course you are feeding the energy of negativity into that consciousness and will be more likely to create that of a negative consequence. Well, I want to thank you for answering all of these questions. It's been incredibly enlightening, and I really appreciate you in taking the time and helping humanity in this incredible shift that we're going through. Yes, of course, it is truly our greatest excitement. And as we've expressed to many humans, as you are asking the query, we are looking at your energy in a way that we have never perceived your energy before. And because all of us are one, it allows us to perceive parts of our energy that we have never perceived before. So as you are growing, so too do we grow, because we are all part of one another. We congratulate you for your growth as an individual, but also as a human collective. 
And we thank you for the growth that you have given us in this very beautiful co-creation as well. Thank you. Yes, of course. Adju. All right. Oh, I had to go. It's good. Is it disconcerting to come back? I mean, I, I remember, you know, when I when I used to drink a lot, I never hated, I always hated blacking out, you know? Mm. <laughs> so I, mm. I, I'd wake up in the morning like, oh man, I hope I didn't say anything crazy. <laughs> so I mean, the, the, sometimes there's a little of that, like for new audiences, I'm I'm talking to you and, and you have an audience who, who's not met me yet. There might be a little bit of that, but I trust my channeling now. I've been doing it for so long. Um, I have had some experiences where I came out of recording. I was doing a pilot show and mm -hmm. my friend who I've gotten to know for many years and a new guy who I just met a year before, they're looking at each other very intensely. When I get out of channeling, I was like, what happened? You know, what, what, what's going on here? Why is everybody looking all crazy at me? Um, but it was a technical issue uninvolved uh, okay. me, but most of the time, yes, um, I'm perfectly good with it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I can see that it's drained your energy a little bit. So it, yeah. it's an interesting process to evaluate. Yeah. Um, and so and also uh, the 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 change of accent is pretty fascinating too. I've seen that with a lot of channelings. Um, but it, it sort of helped me to visualize this being a little bit at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ardiff's actually very, um, very interesting looking being. So is Trev. I'll, I'll send you some art that's pretty accurate of them that that one of our uh, artist friends um, did. Yeah. And it might give you a good, good visual aspect. Ardiff's a little, little uh, blue skin guy with purple hair, purple eyes. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> it looks wow. like most people think it's a female or feminine being. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know you have a channel panel on january 3rd to the 5th in sedona so people can come to this event they can also you're going to have ability to get live stream access i'm going to have a link in the description and in the comments so that you can gain access and there's going to be some other channelers as well is that correct yeah we're going to have a ton of other channelers uh daryl anka who channels bashar is going to be there doing channeling um wendy kennedy who channels the pleiadians lisa royal holt um jamie price daniel scranton uh we've got a bunch of them um and they're all on the website the channel panel um it's going to be a three-day event um and my wife and i put this together and my wife and i both will be channeling at the event also um and we're going to be adding more presenters even though it's only 90 days till we're there we still have three or four more uh people to announce we're just waiting to finalize the details with them and uh, we're going to have th three days jam-packed full of channeling. It's like a channel palooza, right? It's um, yeah. it's really amazing. We've done these before. Um, we had to take a break. Um, our daughter, who's five, was born with Vodder's Association. So she had to have like four surgeries by the oh, time no. she was four. Plus, she's nonverbal autistic. So between her and my son, we, we kind of couldn't do these um, for a while. But this is our first one since first live one since 2017 and then we did 2018 and 2019 online but we've been doing them since like 2013 or 14 and um we, we've gotten to know a lot of channelers it's really yeah. amazing thing do you I, i've asked this other in another interview but do, do you ever have a situation where you have two channeled entities co conversing with each other um we or asking questions to each other or anything like that uh, we haven't done that on a channel panel before, but I personally do that. Um, I, I do a, a school in Japan uh, every month. Uh, me and this other guy who's also going to be channeling at the channel panel, his name's Tyler Ellison. Uh, we both channel that way simultaneously um, in the school for Japan, and they really enjoy that. They They answer questions or talk back and forth to each other. So it's something that I've rarely ever seen, but uh, me and Tyler have done that. Me and Wendy Kennedy have done that. Uh, me and my wife have done that. So it wow. is something that's very fascinating to see these different channeled entities. But something too that that really I love about the events, people come in there with their own guides and their higher self really connected. And to be able to fill a room full of all these different beings um, with like, especially when you have very seasoned old school channelers who've been doing this like decades or longer, 
it's just so powerful to be in that vibration for three days. It's overwhelming for, for quite a few wow. people. They go home and crash for like days after it's done, but That's amazing. it is, it's amazing. Well, it was a real honor to meet you. And, you know, you, you probably need to get a little bit of rest here so you can rejuvenate from the channeling. <laughs> But thank you, and I would love to talk to you again, as I am also going to be, um, as you invited to me, I'm so super honored to, to read some of these channelings, and you sent me some transcripts, so I do want to share with everyone that we're, we're going to read a little bit more of this stuff, and we can learn from it. And as I say with all channelings, and I think you would agree, if it resonates with you, then go with it. If, if, if it somehow, if you disagree with it, let it go. We're not forcing anything down your throats. We're providing a perspective. And if it resonates with you, then, then that's when you want to roll with it. And, that, and that's all that we can do with channeled information, right? Yeah, I'm a thousand percent uh, in agreement with that. Um, channeling is an art, not a science. It yes. comes through the human body. So we are imperfect and can filter channeling. Um you know, even though when you practice at it long enough, you're filtering less. So I, I feel like a lot of the people I know who've been doing it for decades are good. But the point is, even if even if you're a perfect channeler, not everyone's going to like everything in, in some way. Take what's useful, leave the rest. Just like in Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, just like in channeling, just like in life, you know. Connect with what you really feel in the heart and just let the rest go, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you, brother. I really enjoyed my time with you and look forward to connecting with you more. We return you now to your local announcement.